I was looking at some uh, production figures from Australia. I was giving them in class the other day, and, and it's been flat for a long time. Uh, sort of oscillating up and down, but really flat compared to New Zealand, which has skyrocketed. Uh, here it's um, it's going up like like New Zealand, uh, but that's that's because of the nutrition of the, of the cows. They uh, it's not a pasture based um, regime. There's Death Valley, and uh, from here to here is is a three and a half hour drive. It's 200 miles exactly, and then it's about four hours to San Francisco, which is 233 miles. So we're about halfway, and that little distance is about 10 miles from the Pacific Ocean. And if you look at the picture over here, that's the Pacific Ocean in the background, and that's 10 miles away. And uh, I don't know whether that's actually the ocean there. I think it might be a little bit further on, but uh, this is the University, Cal Poly, and that is, this mountain here is what I'm looking at outside my window. And so I'm, I'm about here, and I'm sort of looking in this direction towards the mountain. It's heading towards the ocean, and these are volcanic plugs here. There's nine of them. They're called the Nine Sisters. And as I mentioned before, I, I've, I've climbed. Uh, they go, they, they stretch out to the coast. So, uh, uh, and there's only nine of them. So you can see them all going out to the ocean here. Well, these are only, this one's about 500 meters high, so it's not, it never gets snow on that. So, uh, it's uh, and I've climbed three of them, and many of them are restricted for, due to safety reasons. Some are privately owned, and uh, so I think I might be able to climb a fourth one, but uh, I've just done the two at the moment. Oh, th sorry, the three at the moment, I should say. This, this is not what it looks like now. This is this. It, it's a very seasonal rainfall, and it rains in the winter, which is about October through to March. And from March to October, there's no rain. So we are right at the end of six months of no rain. So it's it's just it's just completely brown around here. Uh, so that's that's the way it uh, the way it is. Um, but the beauty of that, that's why and that is why the movie industry is in California because they're guaranteed a six months of sunshine. So if they want to film outside, they don't have to worry about rain. I'm just a cheesemaker, and uh, but, uh, I guess the older I get, the, the, the more interesting other people's research appears to me, and that's why I've been working with a lot of uh, nutrition and digestion chemistry over the last few years. So, uh, uh, Jennifer or Chris, I should say, if you've got your, your arrow sitting in the middle of the screen. Here we go. Gone. So I'm going to talk about the complexity of milk structure and why it makes dairy products healthy. And I'm going to take you on a tour through the what milk structure is all about and, and why it's unique, and some of the health benefits that, that can come out of dairy products brought about by the design of the milk products. So I think cows are really, really clever beasts that they've designed such a, a complicated structural uh, product such as milk and, and how that is, is, is healthy for us to, to drink and consume as, as other dairy products. So let's uh, move on. We uh, So structure, w w what is it all about? If you can think of a simple structure, that might be something like uh, sugar in water. So it's just a molecular compound that just floats around in, in water. Uh, so it's not uh, not too complicated what happens here in that situation. But in dairy products, here's examples of two dairy products that, that, are, that are very complicated. And the first here is pizza cheese. And this is a confocal micrograph, and it illustrates quite well the complexity you can get. And so this little bar down here, I think, was 5 micrometers from memory. I don't think I wrote that down. And you'll see the fat phase in yellow. You'll see the protein phase in green. You'll see the water phase in the mozzarella cheese uh, that is uh, black. And I refer to it as pizza cheese because it's not really the Italian mozzarella. And down here you see these tiny emulsified fat globules as, as well as these great big aggregates of fat. So all of this brings about a huge complexity in structure and also the, the ability to generate some unique textures and flavors and also that impacts upon the release of nutrients when you consume these products under digestive conditions. I don't have a nice color picture of butter, but uh, this is, uh, again, very complicated. We have an air cell right here. We have water droplets. We have fat globules that are still intact. We have partially ruptured fat globules. And we have fragments of what's called the milk fat globule membrane. And that's a very important component of milk because it contains a lot of things that, that uh, have uh, some scientific evidence to promote health when we consume them. 
So let's look at a diet where structure is not important. Now, some of these things here, I, I guess we don't consume too much, but let's, let's focus on the top one here. I think this is just a bag of amino acids, so that's representing a protein structure, but very, very simple. Here we have sugar, so again, very simple, like I said before. We've got some mineral water here, which I do recommend you have every day, very tasty stuff, uh, good for you. And uh, I don't think anybody consumes Dr. Chase's syrup of linseed and turpentine. I don't know. That's a very simple liquid product. And uh, finally down here is something that has nothing to do with my talk, but it was a great picture I took in a, a museum once. And it is uh, 16 lac laxative tablets, but the bad thing is that they work while you sleep. And I guess you don't really want that to happen. You want to work before you go to sleep or after you wake up. So these are very, uh, at least the, the, these three here, are very simply, uh, simplistic structures. So let's look at interfaces. And, of course, in milk, we have different phases, such as fat and protein and water. And so they have interfaces against each other. Because oil does, doesn't dissolve in water, so there's always an interface between the fat phase and the water. And what I'm, what I'm interested in from a scientific point of view is this particular interface that I'm indicating right now, which is called the milk fat globule membrane. And from top to bottom, this is an increasing order of... Uh, magnification, so from five-fold down to 50,000 times. And when we get down to that level, we can start to see the fat globule with the membrane, and we see these circles here, which are the casein micelles, and they, them, they in themselves are a very, uh, very complicated structure. And in the background, we have what's called the serum phase, which is just basically the water phase of the milk. So I won't uh, discuss the parameters here. You can look at that uh, when you download the, the presentation. So I believe firmly that structure is the, 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 the center of a lot of different aspects of dairy food, uh, um, dairy food quality. The most obvious one is that structure develops texture. So we know that if we have more protein in a product, it's going to be a firmer texture. Also, when we talk about interfaces, then we can get enzymes that sit on interfaces like the fat globule that initiate flavor reactions that are enzymatic in nature. And so we've done a little bit of research on that lately to find out how interfaces impact upon flavor. Of course, structure impacts upon the appearance because milk and cheese have different structures and they look different. Over here we've got digestibility, and I'll talk a bit about cheese digestibility later. That impacts upon uh, how a food is broken down in your gastrointestinal tract, and that dictates the release of nutrients and bioactive components, and that impacts upon the health that you have when you consume these products. And finally, shelf life is dictated by structure. So where are the microbes located? Are they able to find substrates to eat and, and, uh, and grow? And uh, uh, this is what I refer to as, as food microenvironment and safety. So structure is very important uh, for a lot of different quality attributes of, of um, dairy products and food in general. So I'm very interested in generating new food structures. And so I'd like different textures in, in products to see what, what the impact is what, uh, and how does that uh, generate flavor reactions. And the number of different things here that I've listed that impact, uh, that, that tell us how structure can generate different texture and flavor reactions. And, and some of them uh, I'll just briefly mention. Uh, if we have enzymes that are protected in a food product, then sometimes they can't react with their substrate and therefore cannot produce flavor compounds. And down here, what kind of oral processing conditions occur in our mouth? And that dictates how the food is broken down and also what the flavor is going to be like. And also very simple processing conditions, such as heating, cooling, churning, homogenization, and we've done some work on pulsed electric field processing, what does that do to the enzymatic reactions and therefore the flavor of dairy products such as cheese? So it's, let's take a little step back here and talk about nutrition. It, it's much more than just calories. So the minimum energy requirement for us as human beings is 7,500 kilojoules per day. That's from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And uh, how do we measure that? Well, we use a thing called a bomb calorimeter, which was... Uh, the measurement, uh, the, the concept surrounding the measurement were developed by a fellow called Wilbur Atwater back in the 
uh, the 1800s. And there's a very tiny picture of him here, which he seems to have shrunk since I uh, sent this sent this uh, presentation uh, across the Pacific. And so what happens is you put a food product in here, in here and you, you just um, digest it. And the digestion is very stringent. It, it's, it's a, that's why it's called a bomb calorimeter. And uh, what that is, is from that you can work out what's called metabolizable energy. So it's the energy that's present in the food, which you measure using a bomb calorimeter, minus the energy lost in urine and feces. And that's equivalent to around about 200 grams of milk fat per person per day. So that's how much energy you need using this measurement system to, to exist as human beings. Now, there are lots of problems with this system. Uh, one big problem is that there's an assumption of no food component interactions, which is, in effect, structure. And we have a lot of that in milk products. So for that reason, I, I firmly believe that milk has some structural and therefore health advantages over other kinds of products. So another way of measuring energy is, of course, our friend here, who's going to appear. He's not going to appear, is he? Wait a minute. There he is, Albert Einstein. And uh, you, down here, E equals MC squared. That's his famous formula. And so to get enough energy to live, you have to eat eight... 80, not 80 nanograms of food per person per day. And of course, that's a ridiculous kind of calculation because you don't, there's no nuclear combustion taking place in our digestion system. Much the same as a bomb calorimeter does not mimic what happens in our gastrointestinal tract. So this is what the bomb calorimeter tells us is happening. That we have a gut system, which is going to appear very, very slowly. There it is. And inside, we have a furnace, which consumes the, the products. And of course, this is ridiculous. We don't, we don't digest food products like this. We have a much more complicated food structure that doesn't involve uh, lighting fires inside of us. And so the bomb calorimeter is not a, a particularly good measure of the energy that we, uh, that we get out of consumption of food products. So this is the human digestive con uh, um, conditions, well, tract in this case. And I've got a lot of information here which I'm not going to read out. Simply say that it is, I'll pick out the interesting bits here. The first is that the total transit time is about one half of a day to two days. So that uh, probably matches up with people's experiences. We have a large, in, uh, the food comes through from the first part of digestion is in the stomach. So that's the gastric digestion. Then we go through the duodenum, that's a very low pH. The duodenum is a, is a near neutral pH. Uh, it then goes through the small intestine and the large intestine and finally comes out uh, through the, the anus right at the end here. So that's, that's a very long uh, process of digestion. It's not something that takes place very quickly. Uh, this is about nine meters long uh, with lots of folds in it and that uh, helps or aids in the absorption of nutrients uh, through the, the gut system. Uh, now, I'll mention cholesterol later on, but cholesterol is very important. Uh, you need that in order to uh, digest fat. So if you don't get cholesterol on your diet, then your body's going to produce cholesterol because you need that. You need that. Uh, so that, um, and the other thing I want to point out is that there's no clear-cut correlation between consumption of food products that contain cholesterol, such as milk and eggs, and the buildup of plaque in your arteries. Uh, so that does happen, of course, uh, but uh, uh, the cholesterol in your, uh, uh, in your bloodstream doesn't necessarily have a direct correlation with the dietary consumption of cholesterol. There are other uh, genetic things that come into play. And, of course, digestion is, is hugely complicated. So it's not just a simple matter of uh, what you eat gets into your body. So we'll talk briefly about protein digestion. Uh, if we have a, a thermal treatment of milk proteins, what they can do is unfold some of the whey proteins, and that actually increases digestibility. So, and it's the same with egg yolk, uh, egg white as well. If you consume raw eggs, which I don't think many people do, you're actually getting a much better nutritional hit if you if you uh, boil the egg first, because the the egg proteins in the white are unfolded and more digestible. If you have enzymatic cross-linking of proteins, and that may be reasons for doing that, if you have a network structure developing, that reduces digestibility, and that may be cheese, for example. If you have adsorption of proteins to interfaces that can increase digestibility as well. And I'll put up a graph to show you a little bit uh, about uh, that particular uh, aspect, which is right here. So this is two kinds of emulsions. The first is a uh, milk protein called lactoferrin, which is 
coating the, the globule. And the second one is beta-lactoglobulin. And if you look at, and I'm going to appear next to here, if you, took, if you put bile salts into that system, that can cause a partial displacement of the beta-lactoglobulin from the interface. So if you have a sphere of fat, it's got beta-lactoglobulin on the interface. If you add bile salts, it knocks some of that beta-lactoglobulin off. And so you get more protein coming off the emulsion surface. So this is going to happen during digestion. If you design or, or, or let's say engineer a food product using dairy ingredients, such as lactoferrin in an emulsion, the bile salts actually absorb because they, they are oppositely charged. And what that does is it, um, it, it has no effect on the release of the lactoferrin from the emulsion. And so that's very interesting. And it does, I think, give a good illustration of how structure is very important for the release of nutrients under digestive conditions, even this, although this is a very simple emulsion system. So let's click on. And this is lipolysis, which is a breakdown of fat that takes place when you digest it. So here's a glass of uh, raw milk, probably. Yeah, it might be pasteurized, but it's not homogenized in this case. Up here, we have homogenized milk, which is what we normally, normally buy in the supermarket. And the axis here is the release of fatty acids. And so you need these fatty acids released for nutrition when you, when you digest the milk. And so it's interesting to see that for homogenized milk, we get more lipolysis and therefore more of that lipid nutrients when we consume that kind of a product compared to just simply consuming raw milk or pasteurized milk that hasn't been homogenized. Now one of the key enzymes is pancreatic lipase, which needs to digest these emulsions. And it does a much better job at releasing fatty acids from the homogenized milk, which backs up the graph over here on the left, compared to native milk. But oddly enough, the pancreatic lipase activity is lower on the interface, and this is probably a surface area effect because, of course, when you homogenize milk, you get smaller fat globules, and you get a lot more of that fat water interface that I talked about before. And that actually increases the, uh, the, the activity of the pancreatic lipase. So again, just simple things like homogenization can have a rather profound effect on digestibility and release of nutrients in the gut system. And uh, I promise I won't put to, to, too many of these scientific uh, uh, arcane kind of graphs up here, but this is a, a system where uh, lipases are injected into a natural milk fat globule membrane uh, uh, interfacial system. So this, this is a, a mimic, a mimetic of the natural fat globule. And so by injecting lipase, what we're doing is we're saying this is what happens during digestion. The first thing it does is it greatly increases the area. So that means that the lipase gets in there amongst the components of the milk fat globule membrane, and then it can start to hydrolyze the fat and release the nutrients. Now this is really interesting here on the right. Protease peptone fraction is, is a fraction that's found in milk and if you eject that in first and then eject the lipase you don't get that rise and so this is kind of an inhibitory system that prevents the release of nutrients such as that are derived from lipids in your gut system and that may be, maybe there's a reason milk is designed that way maybe we need to have it limited by having that, that particular fraction present in the milk so again the cows are very clever they know what we, what we need to drink and uh, finally, uh, the digestion of cheese. This is it with a high calcium and a low calcium cheese. And this is digestion time over a six hour period. And basically, the higher the, the number, the more lipid breakdown and production of fatty acids occurs. And, and what takes place if you have a high calcium cheese, like a Swiss, for example, you're going to get more lipid release than you would for a low calcium cheese. Uh, and so let's take a look at, I'm going to write next to that. There are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, the second one is not so interesting. The, the greater extent of fat globule aggregation at higher calcium uh, actually uh, uh, causes or promotes the release of lipids because you've got a larger fat globule structure. But this one up here is very interesting, and that is when you get free fatty acids produced by digestion of, of fat products like cheese or milk or yogurt, 
then the calcium can precipitate the free fatty acids under the neutral intestinal conditions in the, in the lower gut. And what that does is uh, this can allow the lipases to access the interior of the fat globule. And this brings up another point that uh, because we have fatty acids in milk, and we also have a lot of calcium, of course, because that's a, that's a good source of calcium, the calcium can react with those free fatty acids and actually inhibit the lipid absorption. So milk, again, is designed in such a way uh, the cows know that they're, they're feeding us a, a high-fat product, and so they've introduced this calcium into it in order to mitigate the effects of having too much lipid digestion and, and therefore absorption into our, into our system through the, through the lower gut. So again, a great design. I'm not so sure the cows are that clever, but let's just say they are. So postprandial FA lymphatic absorption, what on earth does that mean? Postprandial means after dinner, so you've eaten already. FA is fatty acids, and your lymphatic system is, is, is from the circulatory system in your body. And this is an interesting study uh, that uh, came out uh, more than 10 years ago. If you have the same lipid content in a dairy product, and uh, we have either butter, cream, or cream cheese, there's going to be less absorption of fatty acids if you consume butter compared to cream or cream cheese. And this is all due to the complicated structure of butter. So there is some limiting effect that occurs in that structure that limits the fatty acid absorption in our diet. And this is, this is all controlled to 30 grams of lipids per uh, dairy product. Butter, mozzarella, and milk are similar, but there's a delayed triacylglyceride peak for butter. And this is the study done during, during, using type 2 diabetes subjects. And so if you consume butter, that you don't get that great hit of, of lipolysis, fatty acids, into your, into your lymphatic system. It's actually delayed because of the structure of the butter, the complicated structure. So I'm going to talk about uh, the milk fat globule membrane. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a picture of the, the budding fat globules inside of the, um, uh, inside of the, the memory, memory gland epithelial cells. And so it has to be coated with something, and that something is the milk fat globule membrane. It contains a lot of bioactive functionality, which is a subject of a lot of research uh, that I'm doing. So here's the composition. All the usual suspects here, proteins and phospholipids and uh, cholesterol, of course. Uh, and then we have different kinds of, uh, different kinds of phospholipids and uh, uh, acylglycerides. Uh, carotenoids, that, get, that gives the color of the, of the fat phase, which is, of course, the yellow color. Uh, and then if there are a whole bunch of proteins that are present here as well. And uh, the one that uh, I've done some research on is uh, xanthine uh, oxidoreductase. And that, that's the most common enzyme present in milk. And it's, it, it exists in the milk fat globule membrane. It's there for a purpose, and it's interesting to find out why it's there. But more interestingly, from my perspective, is to find out what does that enzyme do? What enzy enzymatic reaction does it create in dairy products as a cheese? Does it give an oxidized flavor if it's present in a free form? This is some, some work that we're uh, looking at currently. And uh, the polar lipids, uh, I'll talk about those very briefly, but there are six of them listed here. And this top one is often known as lecithin, phosphatidylcholine, and they're present in varying amounts. Note sphingomyelin, that's a little, little different structure on a molecular scale. And that has some, some known uh, health benefits. And I have just noticed I spelt it incorrectly. So sphingomyelin, the E and the Y, y are in the wrong way. So lots of things affect uh, composition. Here's a, a nice little calf that I think was less than a week old when I took that picture. All sorts of things affect it. Age, breed, stage of lactation, uh, the quality of the milk, seasonality. Very important in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, here it's not so important because of the supplementation of the feed, uh, the diet, milking frequency, and different processing effects uh, such as uh, the ones I've listed there. So this is a summary of the factors that impact upon lipid digestibility. And it basically summarizes what I've said already. So I'm going to leave that to you for you to read at your leisure. Here is the MFGM topological model. So down the bottom here we have the interior of the milk fat globule. This is sort of a cutaway picture. Then we have a three-layer, tri-layer region. So we have the phospholipids here. 
and they have their their fatty acid parts anchored into the into the interior of the globule. We have a cytoplasmic region. We have a bilayer, and we have these uh, um, embedded uh, uh, sphingomyelin, which are the green molecules here. And in association with the sphingomyelin is cholesterol. That's that little yellow rectangle, and that's raised slightly above the level of the orange phospholipids. And then we have these uh, wonderful Christmas tree here, and uh, that that. I've just lost my. Um, let's see what I can. Oh, it's connected. This little Christmas tree here. This is right here. This little. Uh, uh, is it a hex? No, it's a. It's an octagon down here. Xanthine oxidase. Uh, spelt in French, I should note here too. It's a very, very complicated structure, and this, I believe, is is the reason that we have flavour in cheese. All of the components in here interact. They are all located in exactly the right position in order to generate reactions to cause flavor in cheese. Now, of course, the microbes, the bacteria have their own system. They develop flavor compounds as well. But uh, this is uh, an integral part of flavor development. And I know that because if you take off the milk fat globule membrane and emulsify milk fat with skim milk powder, you can still culture it with dairy uh, with, with with lactic acid bacteria, but you don't get good cheese flavor coming through. You need this membrane layer. And uh, conversely, if you take uh, deodorized mineral oil and emulsify it with milk fat globule membrane material, which is a component of buttermilk, then you, you can get good cheese flavor coming through. So it's not the fat that's important. It's really the membrane layer that's important for flavor. So that region here I talked about is where the sphingomyelin cholesterol lives, and this is a this is where it's located in an actual picture of a fat globule. So that that's not a hole. That is where the cholesterol lives with the sphingomyelin. So this is a Jersey fat globule, and we call that a liquid disordered region, and it has unique properties. And you'll see little budding bits of milk fat globule membrane coming off the surface here of, of this Jersey globule. This is about 17 micrometers across, so it's quite a large fat globule. But the important thing to note here is that sphingomyelin and cholesterol are in close association. And when you consume dairy products, that limits the absorption of cholesterol into your lymphatic system because of the association with sphingomyelin. There's some evidence out there that that's the case. So drinking milk or drinking a uh, drinking cholesterol or mixed in some kind of oil, uh, they will have two diff different effects. The milk has mitigating factors that stop the absorption of plaque in your arteries, the absorption system from taking place, whereas if you consume cholesterol straight, uh, you may not get that, that protection. So uh, that's, um, this just tells you, this is atomic force microscopy, it tells us how much that cholesterol sphingomyelin layer is raised above the level of the surface of the fat globule. So this is the, the, the black circles I talked about before. They're raised a very, very tiny amount uh, above, the, um, above the surface. Okay. Now, let's just get my... Now, I have charged batteries here, so I don't know why it keeps losing, losing battery power. There we go, connected again. And we, we made some, some very large ones here. These are about 25 micrometers across, and these are synthetic fat globules. And when we made them with individual milk fat globule membrane components, spontaneously we got these black holes forming. So that was a really clever work that was done by this guy here, Ho Shin Jiang. He was my PhD student. And uh, this we can do a lot of model study, model system studies on the milk fat globule membrane using these. A giant unilaminar vesicle model systems. So uh, enzymes are present, lots of enzymes in milk, and they're, they're compartmentalized. So on the left side we have membranes that are present in the milk fat globule membrane. Up the top there we have membranes that are present in the uh, enzymes that are present in the casein micelle, and down the bottom we have enzymes that are just in the, in the water phase of milk. And so where they're located and their proximity to their substrate dictates whether reactions actually take place or not. And those reactions can generate flavor in, in products, particularly cheese. 
So the MFGM functionality, there's a picture uh, right, uh, um, see it right here. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit frightened to move this, this mouse around in case I run out of batteries again, so I'll leave it up the top. And uh, that is a, what's called a liposome system. And it sort of gives an idea of what a, what a milk fat globule membrane might look like, but this is only a bilayer, not, not a, not a trilayer system. And it can do lots of things, such as emulsify fat in dairy products. It can carry flavors. It can uh, um, mask flavoring agents if you don't want them in the want want to taste those products, such as if you want to encapsulate fish oil in, in cheese. Uh, I don't know if anybody want to do that, but you could. And uh, there is also an impact upon cheese when it's added. And I mentioned before, it's a key in, ingredient of buttermilk. Uh, it can increase the moisture content and yield of cheese. It can decrease oil formation when you heat uh, pizza-style cheeses, pasta falada. And it can also improve flavor of cheese. And using microscopy, you can see bacteria like to congregate near the fat globule interface. And so if they like to be there, that, that, that puts them in close proximity to substrates in the MFGM that do produce those flavor compounds. So in other words, if you take the fat out of cheese, particularly the MFGM, then you'll get something that's, that's not particularly nice to eat, be uh, very low flavor and uncheese like So this is how we extract MFGM from buttermilk. It's a commercial cream separator up the top. And down there you'll see my wonderfully, uh, wonderfully funded lab. Uh, this is uh, how we make uh, buttermilk. So you know, it, basically what you do is churn cream to make butter. Take the butter off and you give it to students like Alice, and then uh, you take the buttermilk and extract from that the MFGM component using different kinds of centrifugation techniques. So a lot of lab work I was doing back in New Zealand uh, looked a lot like that bottom picture. In fact, uh, probably some of my students looked like that too. Right, so here we have buttermilk. We wash the cream, churn the butter into cream, make butter, discard the butter, make buttermilk, and then we can dry that, and dairy factories do that. Uh, and on the right there, you'll see a product which is just basically a spray-dried buttermilk. And the problem with spray-drying is it's a heat-intensive process. It, it tends to denature enzymes, and so you lose that enzymatic functionality, which is one reason why buttermilk powder is a low-value powder. Uh, probably the most important reason it's a low-value powder is because it's of a dubious micro microbiological quality and you get lots of things in there that you have to heat the powder to kill off those unwanted spoilage organisms before you sell the dried buttermilk powder. So it's a very crude product. Another way to dry it is to use lyophilization, which is a cooling process, and, uh, but that's a batch process and very expensive and uh, probably not, um, uh, not really a sellable idea to the dairy industry uh, at this point. So what is on the open market? We have... Buttermilk powders, so that's Valio sweet buttermilk powder up the top. Very low value product, and I uh, did some work with clay minerals once using that as a, as a way to extract proteins out of milk. And while I was pricing the, pricing the clay minerals, and it was actually more expensive to buy clay than it was to buy buttermilk. Uh, that, that's how low the price got at one point. And uh, uh, I think I've seen it down as low as uh, six or seven hundred dollars a ton, so it's, it's quite a low-value product. So what they're sold for is uh, solubility, clean flavor, and emulsifying ability. Uh, so it's historically low, a low-value product. Uh, uh, a lot of price, a price, a lot of brackets is the U.S. Uh, price, which has considerable variability there. David, uh, David. Before. Uh, lots of different things, see mucosal growth in the, in the gut. Uh, it's uh, also associated with age-related diseases. That's not a good thing, what, what I've got there. Uh, ameliorates anti-inflammatory -infl uh, processes and a protect protection against bacterial and virus infection. So that's, a, that's sphingolipids, including sphingomyelin. Down here we have fatty acid binding proteins, again, anti-carcinogenic properties. And these are all found in the milk fat globule membrane itself. Uh, so here we have uh, phosphatidylserine, one of the phospholipids. This has a positive effect on, on memory retention, alleviates muscle soreness, a liver recovery, uh, again, protection against gut viral infection. Butyrophyllin, that is the most common protein that's found in the milk fat globule membrane. 
It's not an enzyme, but it has some evidence for suppression of multiple sclerosis and also some bactericidal and bacteriostatic properties. So I've got down a, a disclaimer down the bottom there that uh, the scientific evidence is weak in some cases, in, insufficient in other cases. It might be quite strong in some cases. So the jury is still out on some of these health claims. So what is sold on the open market? Snowbrand has a product called Neo Kids Plus, and basically these are just uh, unstructured milk powders where lots of different components of the milk fat globule membrane are thrown in and dried into a powder, and this one's used as uh, uh, infant formula. Uh, Fonterra has a couple of products, fossil lipid concentrates and gangliosides that they sell. Again, these are, these are uh, uh, relatively crude extracts compared to what you would find uh, in, in a laboratory extraction. Friesland Campina, the wonderfully named Dutch lady growing up milk, and that contains no cosohexanoic acid and salic. Uh, uh, sorry, I missed that one. Uh, Sialic acid. Arla Foods, Lactoprodan, uh, and they've named this one MFGM10, and so these are the components that are present here. And whether you can make claims depends, I guess, uh, where you're selling the product, any kind of health claims. And finally, Meiji, which is, uh, again, fortified with docosahexanoic acid for cerebral and retinal development. So I guess you have to be careful about what kind of things you claim on your products. And a lot of these are, 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 are produced for the infant formula market. So I'll talk very briefly about uh, xanthine oxidase. It's uh, an enzyme that's the most common enzyme in the milk fat globule membrane. There's a nice structural picture of it here. And it, uh, it's known to uh, initiate this reaction from hypoxanthine to xanthine to uric acid. And uric acid crystals, which you'll see down here, if they accumulate in your joints, you get something called gout forming, which is uh, not a very nice, uh, nice thing to have happen. And there is a product called allopurinol, which is an isomer of, um, an isomer of a hypoxanthine, which is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. So it prevents the formation of uric acid and the buildup of crystals. This is called, uh, uh, historically, a long time ago, known as rich man's disease or the disease of kings. And uh, if you contained uh, a, a diet rich in red wine and uh, fatty dairy products, people thought that you would get this uric acid formation because of the presence of uh, xanthine oxidase in milk, which initiates this, this three-step reaction. Uh, so now we know it's not uh, necessarily the case. Uh, there are other inhibitory uh, chemicals that prevent this reaction from occurring in everybody. And these are some of the reactions that, that, that can take place uh, using different types uh, of, of xanthine oxidase. So very interesting uh, uh, chemical reaction, biochemical reaction in the body. And I'm more interested in what takes place. This is not moving. Here we go. What happens to this enzyme in dairy products? Because it's an oxid oxidizing enzyme, so does it create oxidative flavors in dairy products? That's, I'm more interested in that than, than gout. Uh, and so this is what happens to xanthine buttermilk when you heat it. The xanthine oxidase activity goes down uh, 8 degrees for 5 minutes and you've got no activity left practically. Uh, again, up here, this is in solution. And uh, this is two different temperatures. And as you heat it for a period of time at two different common temperatures for heat treating milk, then you get a reduction, uh, reduction in the, the activity. Now... What, uh, I'm just going to get a battery for my mouse here. If you just excuse me if, if I can reach across here. I think I'm still connected. And I do apologize for that. This, this mouse is just not, not behaving itself. So I will just make a quick switch of the batteries here, and I'm going to hope that works. Now, down the bottom we have a couple of graphs. One is xanthine oxidase in buttermilk. And that is that shows the, the, the effect of uh, the protection 
of the milk fat globule membrane. Uh, so what's actually taking place there is that the xanthian oxidase is not free in solution. It's actually in buttermilk, and buttermilk has a protective effect. And so when you heat buttermilk, you don't get the loss of activity of xanthian oxidase as when you would heat this uh, in, in solution. So again, we have a, what's called a matrix protection effect in dairy products, and it just doesn't protect xanthian oxidase. It can, can protect other enzymes as well. Right. Battery's back on board here. So what, are, what does xanthian oxidase do? It basically oxidizes aldehydes to acids, and that goes into a cascade of reactions, which then produces flavor compounds in cheese. And so it's there at a very high concentration in cheese. And so, of course, the question is, if it's there, what impact does it have on flavor development? And that's been the subject of some research. So looking at the effect of xanthian oxidase in processed milk, this is in milk, and this is a recombined milk. So effectively what we've done is we've taken anhydrous milk fat, we've homogenized it, and we have created a recombined milk product with, with skim milk proteins as well. So you'll note that the milk has lower activity compared to a recombined product, and, and the reason for that is when you make recombined milk, you actually strip off the milk fat globule membrane and all of the hundreds and thousands of components there you mess it all up, and you put it back on the interface of the fat globules through homogenization. And that puts everything in the wrong place. And what it does here with xanthian oxidase is that it puts it in a position where it can react much more with its substrate. And so you get more oxidative reactions occurring in a recombined milk product compared to a fresh milk product. If you batch pasteurize it, you get more activity. High temperature, short time, more activity. Uh, if you store it at refrigeration temperature, you actually get less, uh, less activity. So you could probably make recombined milk products, cool it for a period of time, uh, and then uh, limit some of the effects of oxidation that might occur in dairy products. And we added salt just to mimic a, a cheese environment here and got a very, a very smaller change in oxidative activity. So we thought, what happens in cheese? So we went down to the supermarket in New Zealand and picked out six cheeses and measured their xanthian oxidase activity. And I basically have nothing to say about this graph, except that all the, bar, all the columns are different. I don't know why they're different. So that's, somebody would like to take up that research project. Uh, probably what takes place is that there are reactions of xanthian oxidase in Jarlsberg, which are much more dominant and in the blue vein cheese, and that will have flavor implications. But what those flavor reactions are, we really don't know at this point. So I'll just leave that up there for uh, uh, just for interest. So one final thing we can do with, um, with fat globules is we can wash them with water. And what the water does is it can, act, it can strip off some of the components of the milk fat globule membrane and expose the enzymes so they can they create a much higher degree of enzymatic activity in dairy products. So washing is something you can do with cream. You simply add water to it, centrifuge it, uh, and then skim off the fat, add water again, and centrifuge it again, and just repeat that. Or you can use membrane processing. So here's a native fat globule with bits and pieces stuck to the interface, mostly casein. And when you wash it with either a simulated milk ultrafiltrate, which is the aqueous phase of milk, or if you do it with water, you get a removal of some of those components and therefore less protection of the fat globule and therefore more exposure of the enzymes to react, to create enzymatic reactions. So here is just a, a very quick uh, uh, graph. I won't talk about it too much. That uh, This is relative enrichment after washing up the top and relative depletion. And depending upon the different kind of milk fat, sub, uh, milk fat membrane component, they're either relatively enriched, like these two here, or they are removed, which means they're loosely bound uh, after the washing process. So there's a lot of science uh, investigation. We need to find out what's happening there and what are the implications for, for uh, product quality. Uh, again, xanthan oxidase activity. In raw milk, it's low, but if you wash it, you strip off the outer layer and you, ex you expose xanthan oxidase. And uh, when that takes place uh, with either an emulsion or with natural cream that you've washed, then there is a, the, the likelihood of, of increased oxidative, oxidative activity in products. And so you may not want to wash cream if you're making cheese. Uh, uh, 
a recombined cheese milk product. It, it depends on what kind of flavor profile you want. And we really are only just examining that at the tip of the iceberg now. One last enzyme is glutamyl transferase activity. This is an interesting one because this is the reaction. It reacts with amino acids to create this uh, 5-L-glutamyl amino acid. It's optimal at high pH, which is not the pH of dairy products, which are almost uh, uh, almost all food products are lower than pH 7. And what it does, it creates what's known as a kokumi flavor in, in, uh, in gouda cheese from gamma glutamyl dipeptides. So this enzyme is located in the milk fat globule membrane as well. So if you do any kind of processing to milk, that's, that is likely to impact upon the activity of that and therefore the flavor in this one particular cheese example of this very, uh, dis, this very distinctive flavor that you get in, 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 in gouda cheese. So again, uh, we have an increase for recombination. If we heat treat it, we get an increase. Uh, if we store it, we get an increase again. Uh, and so if you are processing the milk in such a way that it limits the activity, then recombination or partial recombination may be a strategy in order to increase the level of this particular flavor compound in, in uh, gouda cheese. And of course, there's a whole lot of other reactions we don't even know about yet that will impact upon flavor development. So in conclusion, structure is generated by not always enzymatic reactions, but often, and the association of food components, which is called the macrostructure. And this has an impact upon the breakdown under, under digestive conditions and therefore the release and also the absorption of nutrients in your GI tract. So it's not just a simple matter of a firmness of a product or the structural density of a food product that impacts upon digestibility. It's really tied in with the macro structure. So how is everything structured in a food product? So we can have what's called st structural interfacial engineering of food products. And that can have a profound effect on, again, digestibility, release of nutrients, and, of course, health. And the connection between digestibility release of nutrients and health in milk products, we, I, I think we've, we've got many, many lifetimes of research ahead of us to try and even, even uh, break the ice on this to find out what's the connection here between those three things. Uh, so there are lots of things we can control, such as uh, the impact of the interactions of globules with protein matrices and cheese, the composition of the membrane, globule size, and I think this is really going to need a, a team of people who are uh, who are um, nutritionists, uh, gastrointestinal phys phys uh, physiologists, that's a mouthful that word, manufacturing technologists, uh, chemists, uh, people who work in clinical health studies, all of these people need to come together with a team to, to uh, further explore why milk is a much healthier product than we initially thought. So it's time for questions. There is my university right there, same picture at the beginning. And I will open it to questions. So, what's, let's see. So, Alice has asked a question there, David. Can you read out the question yes. first, uh, please? Would we see a similar effect if we wash curd in cheese making? I believe you would. Because uh, what those things are is, is, is quite complicated. So, there will be changes in, in the, as you've written there, on exposing the enzymes. Uh, after the washing process, and the, the the rate and the extent of those enzymatic reactions will change, which will almost certainly impact upon flavor development. And, and I'll have to say, just to as, as a follow-on from that question, what, what what brought me into thinking about these these interfacial concepts in dairy products was, if we take recombined milk and make cheese out of it, we get a very poor flavor because everything's put back in the wrong structural arrangement. And if you're a country like Australia or New Zealand, uh, not so much the US, but Australia and New Zealand uh, are um, in the business of exporting dry milk products, particularly milk powder, um, a lot of anhydrous milk fat as well in some cases, depending on the market prices. If we take those products and send them off to countries that don't have a dairy industry and get them to recombine it, how can we improve the flavor of the cheese so it doesn't taste sort of like cardboard? It's not a very pleasant taste, a recombined milk cheese in a lot of cases. 
So what simple processing techniques can we employ to improve that? Uh, Alice has another question. Uh, sometimes in cheese making we find butter floating on top of the vats. Assuming, uh, yeah, that's that's true. Uh, that that is mechanical damage to the fat globules. Uh, so that is that is uh, that that happened that happens quite commonly in recombined milk products. So uh, the recombined milk products, uh, at least the ones I've experienced with, have been using skim milk proteins to emulsify fat, and any kind of me mechanical stirring can create formation of, um, could create destabilization of the skim milk emulsified fat and you get butter granules and uh, even, even very gentle stirring can do that. Uh, so if you use milk fat globule membrane components then I think that that, that problem is not going to occur to the same extent. Uh, what effect does this have on flavors and shelf life? Something to worry about? Uh, yeah, there, it is something to worry about from an economic point of view that if you're losing fat into the whey uh, through uh, mechanical damage, and that's a that's a that's a loss to the dairy manufacturer. Uh, what effect it has on flavor? Well, you'll probably have l less fat in the recombined milk cheese, uh, and therefore the, the flavor profile will, will be different. But is it uh, Anita? Is uh, Anita has a question? Is it correct that the fat in cheese is encapsulated by a protein structure that includes casein? Well, uh, uh, yes and no. The, the fat itself, when it's produced, is encapsulated by, if you go back to that picture I showed of the topological schematic diagram of the milk fat globule membrane, it's a three-layer lipid phospholipid system with embedded proteins. There was no casein there. So that's what happens when it's, when it's produced. Whenever you mechanically disturb milk, then you get absorption of uh, caseins and sometimes whey proteins to the surface. And you saw that picture that I showed you of the electron micrograph, the, the three fat globules, two of them were washed and one wasn't. And maybe I can go back and show you that. But that that, that showed quite clearly there was casein attached to the surface of the natural milk fat globule membrane. But it, it's not a uh, so much an, a, is it a, that a, one? a, a there it yeah. is there. Hey, you found that pretty quick. Yep. Right, so those large black dots here, those are casein bicells. And, and they aren't designed to be part of the milk fat lobby membrane. They just attach themselves to there when you start to mechanically disturb the milk. So the second part of the question is, and this creates a strong interaction between the fat and the calcium. Yes, it can, because the calcium is almost exclusively located in those black dots here, the casein micelles. So you, you will get that association occurring.